Stan Lee is far from the only person to make a Marvel cameo. In fact, many of the most interesting MCU cameos come from people whom casual moviegoers may never have heard of or expected to see in a superhero movie. Avengers Endgame is a massive film packed with details everywhere you look, but some of its most exciting tidbits and Easter eggs arrive not with the big action spectacles but with the quiet moments. Early in the film, Steve Rogers, aka Captain America, is in New York City, attending a support group for people still struggling to find a way to move on after Thanos wiped out half of all life. The scene mostly revolves around a man, played by Endgame co-director Joe Russo, explaining a recent date he had. But if you look at the people sitting in that circle, you'll notice a bald man with a goatee. That's Jim Starlin, an extremely influential comic book writer and artist who's best known as the creator of Thanos, as well as Drax and Gamora, among many others, and the author of the most important Thanos story, The Infinity Gauntlet, the tale in which Thanos first snaps his fingers to wipe out half of everyone. So Thanos' snap did not erase the man who dreamed him into existence. Every Marvel Cinematic Universe film is packed with Easter eggs, callbacks, cameos, and other details you can't possibly absorb on the first watch. Uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy films are particularly packed, even when compared with other MCU releases. Writer-director James Gunn is particularly committed to his Easter eggs and cameos, and as a result, the Guardians flicks are full of them. Some, like Nathan Fillion's appearance as a prisoner in the first Guardians film, are fairly well known. Others are less so, in part because they often take the form of seemingly random voices. In a post credit scene from Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2, the Ravager leader Stakar is looking to reform his old team, which is made up of members of the original Guardians of the Galaxy, whose Marvel Comics origins date back to 1969. Among them is a robotic head named Mainframe, who is voiced by none other than Miley Cyrus. I miss you guys so much! Miley Cyrus isn't the only music star to cameo in the Guardians of the Galaxy universe. In the first film, we hear a voice on the Ravager ship dubbed the Ravager Navigator. That voice could have been anyone, including some random member of the crew, but since this is a James Gunn movie, he managed to use the voice of one of his friends. This time around, it was rock star and director of House of a Thousand Corpses and the Devil's Rejects, Rob Zombie. Gunn explained, Rob's a friend and he appeared in my first movie, Slither, so now it's become my signature. But I love putting a lot of stuff in my movies for fans. In Slither, every street sign referenced a classic horror film. There were hundreds of them. I'm in service to those people who want to watch a movie again and again. Zombie also made a cameo as an unseen Ravager in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. In X-Men Days of Future Past, Sentinel inventor Bolivar Trask appears before a congressional committee to discuss his solutions to the perceived issues stemming from the mutant population. The congressmen are divided in their opinions, with some believing mutants are largely peaceful and others claiming they're a legitimate threat. One of the congressmen arguing for peace is Chris Claremont, the undisputed most important X-Men writer ever. We have very real enemies out there, the Russians, the Chinese. Claremont took over Uncanny X-Men in 1975 and remained the series' writer throughout the rest of the 1970s and 80s, while also co-creating various spin-off series and standalone graphic novels along the way. Many of the greatest X-Men storylines ever, including Days of Future Past, God Loves, Man Kills, and the Dark Phoenix Saga, were his creation, and he co-created X-Men characters ranging from Mystique to Gambit to Jubilee. He also made a cameo as a man mowing his lawn in X-Men The Last Stand, but in Days of Future Past, he actually gets some dialogue. Claremont's not the only major figure from superhero comics to appear in Days of Future Past. He's not even the only major figure from superhero comics to appear in that congressional hearing scene. One of the other congressmen, who at one point argues with Claremont's character, is none other than Len Wein, another pivotal figure in the history of the X-Men and in superhero comics as a whole. We haven't had an incident in over 10 years. And after what happened in Cuba? That was never confirmed. Wein is a key figure in the histories of both Marvel and DC Comics. He was Marvel's editor-in-chief for a brief period in the mid-70s, and in 1975, he was the writer tasked with reviving the X-Men, a team that had been relegated to reprints for several years at that point. Working with artist Dave Cockrum, Ween devised a strategy to bring the team back with a new group of international members. He soon handed writing duties over to Claremont, but Ween's jolt of energy at this pivotal time in X-Men history was critical. He was also a vital character influence on the makeup of the eventual core team, having co-created Wolverine, Storm, Nightcrawler, Colossus, and more.
For a very long time in the world of comic books, James Buchanan Bucky Barnes was a character you could count on to stay dead, alongside former Robin Jason Todd and Peter Parker's Uncle Ben. He was Captain America's World War II pal, but Cap had to move on without him as he tried to exist in a new era. Then, in 2005, Bucky returned as the Winter Soldier, a Soviet assassin with a metal arm. The storyline became one of the most popular and acclaimed Marvel Comics runs of the 2000s and ultimately made the leap to the big screen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. These days, Bucky Barnes is one of the MCU fandom's favorite characters, so it's only fitting that at least one of his creators should get a little nod on the big screen. In Captain America The Winter Soldier, during one of the scenes in the Hydra Lab, you'll see writer Ed Brubaker, who co-created The Winter Soldier with artist Steve Epstein, helping to work on Bucky as Alexander Pierce interrogates him. Marvel Studios' first Thor film was teased at the end of Iron Man 2 with a post credit sequence that featured Agent Phil Coulson finding the God of Thunder's hammer embedded in a crater in the New Mexico desert. That crater creates an interesting bit of chaos in Thor, as the locals find the hammer and start taking turns trying to pull it out of the ground before S.H.I.E.L.D. manages to quarantine it. This, of course, culminates in the moment when a man, played by Stan Lee himself, tries to yank the thing loose with a truck. It doesn't work. Did it work? Before Lee's truck antics, though, another key Thor writer attempts to pry the hammer out of the ground, J. Michael Straczynski, author of an acclaimed and influential run on the main Thor title in the late 2000s, making him one of the biggest names associated with the character around the time the film was made. Straczynski isn't the only major Thor writer to make a cameo in the MCU. Later in the first Thor film, after the battle on Midgard is won, Lady Sif and the Warriors Three are celebrating their victory with a feast in the halls of Asgard. As Volstagg tells an amusing story about their exploits, the camera cuts to Lady Sif and an unnamed Asgardian man as they laugh in response. That man is Walt Simonson, and if anyone has the right to be hanging out in Asgard with the Warriors Three, it's him. Simonson is perhaps the most influential and acclaimed Thor writer artist of all time, thanks to an epic run on Thor from 1983 to 1987, which introduced many of the series' most popular supporting characters and storylines, including Beta Ray Bill and that time Thor got turned into a frog. His fingerprints are all over the various Thor films, and his impact is still felt in Thor comics today. Some Marvel movie cameos happen because the person making the cameo is a recognizable movie star who might get the crowd excited. Others serve as tributes to comic book creators without whom the characters and storylines featured in the films would not exist. Then there are those blink-and-you'll-miss-them cameos that make you look twice because you're not sure if you saw the seemingly random celebrity or just someone who kinda looks like them. That's the case with one particular cameo in the MCU movie that started it all, Iron Man. As Tony Stark fires up his first-ever Iron Man armor to stage his escape from the cave where he's been kept prisoner, his arc reactor shines onto the face of a seemingly random terrorist, who is then quickly swatted away. That early victim of Iron Man was Rage Against the Machine and audio slave guitarist Tom Morello, who later confirmed his involvement on social media. In Deadpool 2, Deadpool decides he needs to put together a super team to pull off his new mission of stopping Cable. He assembles a group of mutants and a guy named Peter for the job, including Domino, Shatterstar, Bedlam, and someone called the Vanisher. The Vanisher is appropriately named because we almost never see or hear him. He's just an invisible presence in every scene, until the moment when X-Force's parachute jump goes horribly wrong, and several of the would-be heroes die gruesome deaths. The Vanisher, still attached to his parachute, flies into some power lines and is electrocuted. At the moment the electricity touches him, we see that the Vanisher is actually Brad Pitt. It's a split-second cameo, but one of the biggest surprises in all of superhero cinema. How did it happen? Well, according to screenwriter Paul Wernick, Ryan Reynolds himself reached out to Pitt, whose kids are Deadpool fans, after they agreed it would be funny to get an extremely difficult-to-book actor for the cameo. And the rest, friends, is cinematic history. It's in the movie. It's he's in there for just a quarter of a second. It's Brad Pitt. He's, the he's a vanisher, and he, uh, and, he, and he unfortunately dies by electrocution. Yeah. Pitt isn't the only A-lister to make a difficult-to-spot cameo in Deadpool 2. At one point in the film, Cable approaches a pair of locals as they're having a discussion in the back of their truck about, of all things, toilet paper. The point of the scene narratively centers around Cable stealing the truck, but it's also a platform for some hilarious dialogue about the inadequacy of toilet paper. Toilet paper is plenty for an appetizer, but then Huggies Natural Care Wet Wipes. That's your main course. 
One of the men in the conversation is fairly easy to recognize as Firefly star Alan Tudyk. The other, under heavy makeup, is Matt Damon. Deadpool 2 director David Leitch later explained how they pulled that off, saying, Bill Corso, our makeup artist, he's a master at prosthetics. He had Matt in the chair for three hours, and a lot of the crew didn't know. There were some people who had worked with him on movies, but we didn't even tell the crew. His name wasn't on the call sheet. It was a fake name. Nobody really knew what that scene was about. They were like, why are we shooting these two rednecks? We just didn't tell anybody. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.